is it that they're suffering unless somehow God allows it? And if he allows it, how then is he good? Or maybe you struggle with the idea that God gives us free will. We have free choices to make, but then there's his sovereignty and his will is always accomplished. Or maybe you're just someone who doesn't worry about these things. They're, they're too big to think about. And after all, haven't people been arguing about this for centuries? Now, as important as real and real as these common questions are, I don't think they're the primary problem or difficulty, as it were, that scripture presents us with. I think that the constant dilemma the Bible is presenting us with from Genesis right through to the end of Revelation is, is the following one. How can a holy and perfect God be present and in loving relationship with a sinful people? That is the question we should all be asking ourselves. We should be wondering about, marvelling at. And so today, we're going to look at two of the attributes of God at the heart of this question. The idea that God is holy, and the idea that God is loving. And so we're going to start, uh, first of all, with God is holy. And the first question, of course, should be, how do we know? We're going to look at some scripture, of course, uh, to show this. So we're going to turn to Isaiah 6, and verses 1 to 8. The word should come up on your screens. It reads, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Andrew Wilson, in in his book Incomparable, uh, writes this. Perhaps the most central truth about God is that he is holy. Ask a seminary student and she might say omnipotence or providence. Ask the average Joe on the street, they'd probably say love. But if you ask the angels who dwell in his presence, they would say one thing. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. God's holiness is so overwhelming that those in his presence can only continually cry out, holy, holy, holy. Now, in the Hebrew tradition, the repeated use of a word uh, gives emphasis. Jesus does this. He often says, doesn't he, truly, truly, I say to you, uh, by repeating the word truly, he's he's emphasising the truthfulness of the statement he's about to make. But only once in scripture is there a threefold repetition used to describe God. And it's not love, 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 or mercy, 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 or good, good, good. No, it's holy, holy, holy. So what does this word holy mean? Uh, Well, it has one central meaning, basically, which is that God is set apart from us. He is completely different and other from us. And I think this is shown in a number of ways. So first of all, God is set apart from us because of his attributes. We've been learning in this series so far, haven't we, of the incommunicable attributes of God. You know, they're the attributes that are unique to God and God alone. That he's unknowable, he's all-powerful, that he's omnipresent, all-knowing, and so on. Only God has these attributes. Nothing in all creation can claim such qualities. Even the seraphim in our passage, these are angels, uh, cry out, holy, holy, holy. They humble themselves before God because only he is holy. Isaiah 45.5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. He is completely unique in all his attributes. But there's a particular sense that God is holy because of his power and his authority. Uh, We've heard the Jen Wilkin quote, haven't we? That at the end of this series of attributes we've looked at so far, that our conclusion should be the natural place that God should reside or sit upon is a throne. And Isaiah 6 makes this really clear. In verse 1, Uh, It says that the Lord sits on a throne, high and lifted up. The the train of his robe fills the temple. 
His rule and authority fill the temple. Nowhere is untouched by his power and sovereignty. And so the seraphim cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In Revelation, uh, at the end of uh, the Bible, uh, we have another throne room vision. Uh, This time there are four living creatures around the throne, but once again they cry out uh, in in verse 8. It starts on the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all round and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they go on to say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God is worshipped in his holiness for his glory and his power. He's the only creator, the only being from everlasting to everlasting. Okay, but secondly, holiness also carries a sense of being completely and wholly dedicated to God and his purposes. And we know this because in scripture there are a number of things that can be described as holy that aren't God or angels or people. There are holy days, there are holy garments, there are holy utensils, holy altars, holy gatherings, and so on throughout Scripture. And they're holy because they're specially set apart for God's use and purpose. If we were, for example, to turn to Exodus 20 and look at at the Ten Commandments, we would read in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath is a holy day. It doesn't mean that the Sabbath is a better day than the other six. If it did mean that, it would mean we should be having a Sabbath every day, which some people might think is a good idea. But, um, you know, God created all seven days, didn't he? Uh, That we're to work on six days. And that's good. But there's one day of the week specially set apart in which we uh, rest in God. We're reminded of um, his providence, his care for us. And it helps us to remember that as we work those other six days, we're really only uh, working the ground that God has given us to work. And so to be holy means to be dedicated to God and to his purposes. And finally, for God to be holy, it means that he is morally pure and perfect. God is perfect in all his ways. He is always acting in love, in mercy, in goodness, in truth, in faithfulness, with justice, impartially judging with integrity. All God's ways are perfect. He can never act in a way that goes against his holy and pure nature. He he can never sin. He can never lie. He can never repay evil for evil, never favour one person over another because of their position or reputation. God is perfect in all his ways. But we are not. Uh, And therefore we're separated from God because of our sin. And we read, don't we, in Genesis 3 of how Adam and Eve, they refuse to obey God. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it means they're sent out from God's presence. If we look at Genesis 3, 22, 24, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You know, mankind has been separated from God ever since that sin was committed. But Genesis 3 verse 8 tells us something very interesting too, because what it shows is that before God even pronounces that judgment, look at how Adam and Eve react having Sinned. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, we too can run from God. Particularly when we sin, uh, we can feel distant from God. We can feel shame. And so there's a sense in which we're doubly separated from God. We're separated from him because he is holy and he can't abide our unholiness. But also we can't bear his holiness and so we run from it and we hide from it. We see that, don't we, in Isaiah 6 verse 5. Um, uh, The prophet Isaiah reacts, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah thinks he's finished, he thinks he's dead. 
uh, other translations write, I'm ruined or doomed or undone. And he gives two reasons. One, he's a man of unclean lips. And secondly, he dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In other words, he's a sinner. And so is everyone else he's ever met or dealt with. From the moment we're born, we only ever meet other people that are sinners. We've never seen holiness. We don't know what it is. And so Isaiah's sin and his people's sin is his problem right here in the presence of God. So what are the consequences then of God's holiness for us? I I think there are two. The first is God's holiness destroys his enemies as a consuming fire. Throughout scripture, when God dwells amongst his people, no one is able to enter his presence. If they do, they basically drop dead. And that's because if something impure enters God's holy presence, it would pollute it. God can't be holy and tolerate that which is unholy. If he did, he wouldn't be holy. And so Isaiah, he realizes this in this passage. He knows, he knows that he's lost, he's dead, he's seen the king. Leviticus 10 tells an interesting story of uh, two priests, Nadab and Abihu. I don't know if anyone knows this story. Um, The priests offer uh, unauthorized fire before the Lord. What that means is that they were ministering in the temple near the presence of God. They They were burning sacrifices, but they didn't do it in the way that God commanded. And it says that fire consumed them from the altar. Uh, They get burnt up by the consuming fire of God's holiness. Andrew Wilson tells a story of a sermon he had where the, the preacher who was trying to preach on holiness, he just went through all the people God kills in scripture because they treated his holiness with contempt. And if you're thinking this is Old Testament, read Acts 5 and the story of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit and they dropped dead. God's holiness is a serious matter because he will consume his enemies We may not see people being consumed by God uh, every day, but we will all stand, won't we, before the great throne of judgment. Are you right with God today? Would you stand in that judgment? But God's holiness has a different effect on those that he loves. Instead of consuming them, it refines them. We go back to our Isaiah passage, verses 6 to 7. Uh, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This holy burning coal from the altar in the holy temple of God, it touches Isaiah's lips. And instead of consuming him, it should, he's a sinner, it grants him forgiveness. He's accepted and he's purified. And this idea that God is a purifier or a refiner is picked up in a number of the prophetic writings in the Old Testament. We're going to look at one from the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet who's prophesying to Israel at the time when they're returning from exile. The temple lies in ruins, the the walls of the city are destroyed, and he's encouraging them to, to rebuild the temple. And in Isaiah's prophetic vision, he, he starts to look forward Uh, beyond the immediate future. And we're going to read just a bit from Zechariah 13, uh, verses 8 to 9. In the whole land, that's the land of Israel, declares the Lord, two-thirds of the people shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Um, So what we have here is uh, two thirds of the people are going to be cut off and perish. In a sense, they're facing the consuming fire of God's judgment. Uh, But one third are going to be refined in the fire. Now, um, what is a refiner's fire? What does it mean? Well, it's a way that you would purify a precious metal. You, You dig the metal out of the ground and it would be mixed in with all these impurities other metals and other minerals. And so what you would do is you'd, you'd put it in a furnace at well over a thousand degrees. The metal would melt and the impurities would rise to the top. And what the refiner would then do is they would skim off what's called the dross. That's all the, the impurities. And then you would take the metal out of the fire. It would cool. And what you would have is a re-solidified 
gold or silver that is purer than it was before. It's God's chosen remnant, those whom he loves, this third in this passage, who are going to be purified like the metal in God's refining fire. And what's the result? What does verse 9 say? I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. They're, They're purified for relationship. Now, God's work of refining has been accomplished supremely in the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look first at something in Matthew 9, a story you probably know quite well. A, 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 a man comes up to a ruler, comes up to Jesus and says, my daughter's dead, but I have faith that you can bring her back to life. And so Jesus and his disciples, they, they, they head off uh, to, to heal this, this, this girl. And as they're, as they're moving through some crowds, there's another uh, woman there who's got a discharge of blood. She's had it for 12 years. And she knows if she can just touch Jesus, she's going to be healed. And so she reaches out as he's moving through the crowds, touches him, and she is immediately healed. But what I think often we miss in this story is that because of her discharge of blood, she was considered unclean. She was considered impure. She was unable to enter the temple. And, and by touching Jesus, according to Old Testament law, that would make Jesus impure or unholy. But such is the holiness of Christ such is the purifying holiness of Christ, if we approach him in faith, that he doesn't consume her because of his holiness. He isn't made unclean himself. He, he heals her. He purifies her. And as if we don't get the point, Jesus then goes uh, to the, the, the room where the dead girl is. He goes into the room. He touches her hand and she comes back to life. Well, again, you don't go into a room with a dead body. You certainly don't touch it. You're unclean, but not Christ. His holiness brings Uh, purity, it brings healing, it brings restoration, uh, rather than a consuming judgment. But of course, supremely and perfectly we see, don't we, the the purity of Christ, the purifying work of Christ on his cross. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21-22 reads, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. It says, doesn't it, um, in his body of flesh, by his death, he is, he's able to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. If you're in Christ, uh, you are holy and blameless before God. Uh, that's your status because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. At the cross, Jesus tastes death for us, bears our sins for us, that we might be given the perfect obedience and holiness of Christ. In a one touch by faith at the cross of Christ, it transforms you. It purifies you from sinner into saint, from unholy into holy, from guilty into not guilty, from enemy of God into child of God. And this purifying, sanctifying work of God is now at work in us by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, doesn't it, at Pentecost as what? As of uh, tongues as of fire. Again, this this, this imagery of fire, of purification, that, that as, Holy, as the Holy Spirit resides in us, it's refining us. It's causing all that dross in our lives, all that sin, that wickedness, the ways in which we don't honour God, to be slowly removed by God, the great refiner, by the work of the Spirit. And so we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, it says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is at work in your life if you are in Christ, and it's making us more like Jesus, who is holy and blameless. I wonder, are you allowing the Spirit to do its work in your life? That God might be highlighting to you right now an area in your life where you know you need to change, an area where you need the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that purifying work of the Spirit to bring breakthrough and growth in holiness. We would love to pray for you at the end. But we're also, aren't we, a holy people called to be holy. We see that in verse 8 of Isaiah 6, um, that uh, the Lord says, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. His response to the purifying work of the Spirit is obedience. 
And we are called to obedience. First Peter 1, 14 and 15 and 16, in fact, says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If God is holy, if his Holy Spirit is at work in your life, if God is set apart, then we also are called to be set apart. We should not look like the rest of the culture that we find ourselves in. We should be different from them, distinct from them, distinct in our unwillingness to engage in the practices of our culture. Do you refuse to engage with behaviours that you know and are honouring to God? Gossip, lies, slander, stealing, lust and so on. But I think we also need to be distinct in our good works. Are we more loving? Are we more patient? Are we more kind, more forgiving than those around us? Are we known for our generosity, our service, our humility? Okay, so that was, that was a, a look at the holiness of God. We're now going to look at the idea that God is loving and hopefully try and bring the two together. But before we begin, we've got a bit of a problem, I think, defining what love is. I mean, I wonder what you would say if I was to ask you, how would you define love? Uh, maybe it's a feeling. It's the most intense feeling that we can experience. It's something that maybe gives us fulfillment. It makes us feel great. It makes us feel accepted, valued and secure, particularly if we're receiving love. It can give us joy, giving and receiving love. I wonder if you were thinking maybe of romantic love, particularly. That's the one I think our culture celebrates the most. But you maybe, you know, you were thinking of love for the family, um, love for friendship. Either way, I think, I, I think we always see such loves as a feeling. It's very hard to be loving towards someone if we don't feel loving towards them. In other words, there isn't something lovely about the person to love. But we have to be very careful that we define love as scripture defines it. So, uh, we're going to turn again to a scripture, this time in 1 John. God is loving 1 John, uh, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Again, the words should be on your screens. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We have in this passage an amazing statement in verse 8. John says, God is love. We see in verse 7 that love is from God. And in verses 10 and 11, we see the phrases, God loves or loved us twice. In fact, in these uh, six verses, the word love appears 13 times, either in relation to God's love for us or our love uh, uh, for others in response to his love for us. And I think there are different ways in Scripture that God's love is shown. Um, we could talk about how God is Trinity. He is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And that there's a relationship of love between them. You know, each person uh, loving towards one another within the one God. And therefore we could say God is love. Um, he's not a solitary God on his own because love is always directed towards something else. And so within the Trinity, there is love from the start. Uh, we could also talk about how God is loving in the sense that he blesses us continually with good things. We may not always notice them, but he is. Uh, the glorious sunrise in the morning, the stars at night, the friendship, family, good food. Whether you live a life honouring God or whether you live a life deciding to totally ignore him, he showers his blessings on us. And loves us in that sense. And I think a, a third sense in which God loves us is that he offers salvation freely to all mankind. You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. 
that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He offers salvation to all. And all that, that's required is repentance and faith in Christ. You know, it's not based on our status. It's not based on our efforts. It's not based on our connections or our wealth or how clever we are, right? It's a free gift of grace to all who hear its message, high and low, rich and poor. And so in that sense, God is loving to all in that he freely offers his gift of salvation. But fourthly, the one we're going to really focus on, because this is really clear in this passage, is that God is loving specifically in sending his son for us. We're going to look again at 1 John 4, uh, verse 10. It says, in this is love. In other words, this is what the love of God is. This verse is about to tell us what the love of God is. Are you listening? It continues, not that we have loved God. For those who are the, the saved among us, you know, think back to that moment where you gave your life to Christ, that moment where you realised your sinfulness and your need for repent. Uh, for forgiveness from Christ, that you, that you decided to put your trust at that moment. Um, we were sinners, weren't we, at that point, living in rebellion to God, when we heard that gospel message and then we believed. God extends his love to a people who have not expressed any love towards him. I wonder how you respond to people who wrong you. I'm sort of one of those people that if you hear about hedgehogs and rhinos, but I, I'm a hedgehog. I sort of, I can sulk, I go a bit quiet, um, give kind of the silent treatment. But I'm just a sinful, impure person, annoyed that some other sinful, impure person has wronged me. M maybe you're more of a rhino and you would sort of attack with words and, and fight back. But what's God's response to someone who is in total rebellion to himself, walked off and said, I don't want you God in my life. And this is despite, remember, all those blessings he showers on us every day. God loves them. This is a holy love. So in this is love, says verse 10, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God loves us by sending his son whom he loves. His son who he dearly loves to be the atoning sacrifice. Uh, and the, he offers up his own son to pay the price for our sins. And on the cross, Jesus takes our sin upon himself so that we're forgiven and accepted into relationship. This Jesus, called the Holy One of God, has laid down his life of holiness in order that we might be forgiven. If anyone didn't deserve to die, it was Jesus because of his holiness, his purity, his perfection. But he lays his life down for us who deserve death because he loves us. So it's a holy love, isn't it? It's a love that gives without having received. It's a love that's willing to lay itself down in sacrifice for the other, entirely for the good of the other and at great cost to itself. I wonder, do you meditate on God's love for you? Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. Paul prays for the believers that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and height, and depth, and to know the, f the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Our ability to live out the Christian life is so dependent, isn't it, upon our realisation, our knowledge of the love of God for us in Christ. I wonder, do you spend time with him? Do you, do you rest in his love? Do you ask the Spirit to reveal his love to you? And so finally, John then asks us to do the same, our response to that love. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, uh, we also ought to love one another. We're called to a holy love in response to his holy love. We're called uh, to love the other for the sake of the other and not for the sake of ourselves. This, this isn't a feeling. Right? It's a commitment to love the other in thankfulness for the love that we have received. We don't have to expect anything back in this love. We give it freely because it was freely given to us. Christ died for you. He laid his life down for you. And we're called to radical sacrifice and service of others 
even when it's costly for us, maybe especially when it's costly for us. Real love is love that's willing to suffer for the sake of the one it loves. So who do you know in need right now? A neighbour, a work colleague? You have an opportunity to show them, reveal to them the love of Christ. Or who really annoys you at the moment? It's really hard to love. Who's been unkind to you recently? Or who do you need to forgive? These are the opportunities for us to grow in our love. Well, very often I find these are the situations where actually we, we, we grow most. Very often the refining work of the Holy Spirit is a painful process. It's, it's intense heat that melts the metal and purifies it. It's the, it's the work of the Spirit that can sometimes be painful through difficult circumstances, situations, having to love difficult people that we really see God's love for us. So returning then to that question we started at the, at the beginning, you know, how can a holy God dwell amongst the simple people? The answer is because he refines and makes those simple people pure and holy and blameless. And he does that by sending his son to be the atoning sacrifice for their sins. And the son whom the father loves lays his life down in love for those that he will purify. It's love for the undeserving, love for the enemy. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, brothers and sisters, let's be a holy people, radically transformed by the love of Christ and the refining fire of his Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm.